Welcome back friends, welcome back to the homestead. Uh, in a previous video uh, we looked at a list of things that I needed the smart greenhouse to be able to do. Um, in this video, following on from that, I'm going to look in more detail at the actual components that we need. Um, you can see on this screen here, uh, more, more than that. Um, what this video will do is talk about all the components that I need, all the sensors for that smart box and talk about them in some level of detail. What this video won't do is explain how to set them up, how to program them, all, all those kind of things. So it's kind of a bit like a shopping list, but it's a video that I would have found really helpful when I started this journey. And so I wanted to sort of compile it uh, now uh, for other people who are specifically looking at building smart greenhouses or some way to keep plants alive indoors or outdoors. So uh, let's get straight on with it and look at the uh, first components. Okay, so um, let's first of all talk about, I guess, the uh, the heart of it, which is the, the microprocessor. So we've got ESP32, which if you've been interested in this, you've probably heard of already, and I've mentioned lots of times before, but this is what they look like. This is actually called a development board. Um, ESP32 is the chip number, which is here. Um, they come in different variations. The two that I tend to use are either with an onboard aerial here for Wi-Fi or an external aerial here, um, which I haven't can't show at the moment, but I can show you on a, on a separate project because I've got them all in use at the moment. Um, these are 38 pin varieties. Um, you really want to go for the 38 pin variety uh, rather than the um, 32 pins. You get more options then. Of course, um, to be able to um, <coughs> use these, they need to have the legs on. When, when you buy them, just to let you know that some come without the legs. Uh, then as you can see in this packet, um, the legs are separately, the pins. You have to solder them on yourself. Or indeed, some come with the pins, pins already soldered, um, which is nice. And I don't think I particularly knew that when I got them on the website. So it's something for you to look out for. And then in order to use these, you need a cradle um, to put them to sit on. Now, there are um, two types of cradles, and this is a lesson learnt, which I'm passing on to you, which I didn't know. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but the spacing is slightly different between the two. And I got the wrong spacing for the first project, which means I had to stretch the legs. I didn't realise there was two different spacings. Um, let's see if it's if you can see there difference in the spacing. <clears throat> so it's important to get these ones which seem to have goo written on the end uh, rather than these green ones. I don't know if they're always, I don't know if it's the colour that's always different so I wouldn't want to say get the black ones because I don't know if the black ones, if these come in black or not but anyway uh, make sure you get the spacing right. Um, I'll put the minimalist spacing here somewhere so that um, you know the difference. Right next let's look at relays. And the relays that we're going to be using. So, um, first of all, we have the main control relays that will connect to the ESP32. Um, these are five volt relays. They come in singles. They come in twos, fours, and eights. Um, I need eight, so I bought a block of eight really, and I got a few singles for extra for extras if I need. These are um, single pole, single throw relays, just control, uh, you know, one single um, thing. Uh, and then for my, for the actuators on the windows, you need, because the actuators are polarity controlled, they only have two wires going to them and you just switch the polarity depending on whether you want them to open or to close. So in order to do that, we need a way to be able to switch the polarity and I'll be using um, these relays to do that. Now you could use something called an H-bridge, which was pointed out to me in the previous video. Um, I looked into that. Um, the trouble is with the H-bridge, I couldn't find one that would allow enough current um, to go through it. So because when the actuators start up, um, they draw a, a larger amount of current than when they run. And I needed something that would be able to handle that kind of level of current. Um, I didn't want to take the risk of having the H bridge and then having to change it out because it wasn't right or whatever. So I've gone with the relays, um, and what in, a, in order to 
um, house these relays. I've got some relay sockets. And that means if a relay should go, um, I can easily change them out, no problem. I've got some spare ones. Uh, last year, one of these did go, and that was really inconvenient for, for then having to use another one to be able to control because it's um, polarity switching for each window actuator. I needed two relays, one to control the negative and one to control the positive, but vice versa. But with this, it's all done with one relay. Um, and that's the same with any of those actuators, that whether it's controlling windows, doors, whatever it is, you need, to, you need a way to switch the polarity. Um, and obviously it only needs one of these to control that. And the actuator itself will turn itself off once it reaches its full extension or full closure. So you don't need to worry about actually controlling how far um, the actuator will go. It does it, it sorts itself out. So um, that's at relays. Okay, let's look at power next. Let me undo this, that'd be easier. Now, in terms of power, there, there are a number of options here. Obviously, the um, ESP32 has its own onboard power um, and can power other devices, but that could potentially drain. And, and, and the problem I had last year, as noted in the um, faults video that I made, was that um, the Wi-Fi was um, stopping out when other devices were being used, so it was draining on board power. So for this project, everything's going to be isolated power, separate power for each device. Um, you can get these, these which are quick, sort of quick and dirty, 12 volt to um, 5 volt, 3 amp max, 15 watt. Um, they're, I'm not quite sure of the cost now, but you know, sort of. Five ten euros, something like that. Um, voltage regulator, quite simple. Um, would need some kind of heat sink on there, uh, and then you've got something called a buck converter. Obviously, there's six here, and you just break them off when you need them. There's a tiny little screw potentiometer here, and um, you can, using a multimeter, you set that to the voltage that you want. Um, 5 volts in, you know, 12 volts in, 5 volts out in, in our case, and that's quite a nice solution. Somehow, we need a nice way to be able to mount it, but um, yeah, nice, quick, and easy solution there. So, um, and also, you could have other voltage devices as well, but these are the sort of devices that I'll be using on this project, and you can as well, relatively inexpensive. In terms of um, sensors, sort of things in the greenhouse that we're going to be sensing are the normal things temperature humidity of course um, soil moisture uh, and uh, there's different ways to do that but basically um, what we've got here is a DHT22 does um, humidity and basic ambient kind of temperature the, the, the general temperatures in the greenhouse so it comes with a little grate here um, cover it's already obviously you can um, put another cover on top of that to protect the connections. Pretty easy to set up, pretty reliable. I've um, not had any problems with the temperature um, throughout the last two years. So uh, in terms of soil moisture, top tip here is to use a capacitive sensor uh, rather than the resistive sensor. You will find completely reliable these are. They need a little bit of setting up but um, they won't rust. The problem with the Resistive sensor is as two prongs, often with copper, they're just exposed PCB boards, uh, and the copper will react with the soil, and over time, um, or it's exposed metal, some kind of iron, steel, or whatever. Anyway, it will corrode, uh, not necessarily rust, but it will corrode, and it will stop working uh, very quickly, because um, you know metal, metals and water don't particularly go well together. This uses a method of capacity to measure um, the soil moisture, and does some calculations. Um, this is the one that's been used in the greenhouse up until now, it works perfectly well. Another way to measure temperature is with a probe like this. This would be better, obviously, if you need to measure liquids, temperature of liquids, um, temperature perhaps of airflow, which is inside of 
a tube of some description that's being maybe pumped around or whatever, then this would be the right device for that. Um, they come with the boards with a pull-up resistor already in, so you don't have to fart around with you know getting the right resistor and stuff like that, or you can do it yourself manually. But um, for me, this is a lot easier. Nice little set this is with two and uh, all the bits that you need to come together. Um, so that's kind of sensor. The only the other sort of sensor that we might want to use is a simple um, hall effect sensor for door openings and things like that. Uh, very simple. There's a little um, what's called a reed switch in here, um, which is sensitive to it. And here's a magnet. And, and when the two come together, the, the switch closes or opens. And when you know when the door opens, blah blah, then um, it goes the other way. So the board can sense that. And let you know whether the door is open or closed or window or whatever it is. Um, you might need one or more of these. Okay, one more sensor. This is the flow sensor. This is used for measuring um, water flow and flow capacity and stuff like that. Um, inside is a little wheel um, and then there's a reed switch and every time it goes around once one revolution that will let the um, ESP32 know and then you do some calculations to work out the flow rate. Now you can see the way the water goes with the arrow I think. Hopefully, um, it's not going to handle. It's perfectly okay for a greenhouse, single greenhouse solution, a small greenhouse solution. Um, not, you know, for something a bit bigger, a more commercial greenhouse, you need maybe something a bit bigger. But um, for, for what I'm doing, it's perfectly okay. So um, that's sensors. Okay, the last thing to look at is our displays. This is the liquid crystal display that I've been using up until now and you're familiar with the existing project I'll give you two lines of text um, I, can't, I think it's 16 characters along so 32 in total reasonably um, simple to set up and use and then the more modern variant which I'm going to be switching to um, is the TFT display this is a circular one um, requires a little bit more setup well actually quite a lot of setup um, um, but the what it looks like is a lot prettier. I'll give you and I'll give you an example of that. Um, that's the area I was talking about earlier for the device. So here are two circular devices with temperature and humidity. You'll see they look really nice. I've spent an absolute age getting this right. So um, displays obviously are optional, you don't need to have displays actually on the box, but it's quite nice that when you're in the greenhouse you can have a quick look um, on the box as opposed to having to look on a phone or, or go back on the screen or whatever. In addition to the more electronic sort of side, it goes without saying, you're going to need some element of switching. Uh, I've got various switches um, that will be used for 12 volts, 5 volts, whatever, depending on the circumstances. Um, so. And they do, they do have different single poles, double poles, double throws, whatever. Uh, all, all sort of do different things. These kind of flip up and down like for window operation. If you're going to get into this seriously, then it's good to get yourself kitted out with uh, different types of switches that you might need uh, in the future. It goes without saying, um, you need wires, a good selection of wires for different uses. Um, and then some way to keep those wires tidy. There's various methodologies and, and, and solutions out there. Cable ties and cable tie clips um, onto that you can stick onto the box and then keep the, the batches of wires nice and uh, neat and tidy as best you can. It's worth um, getting a few of these. And then last of all, I just want to talk about really how I'm going to plug in the connectors. So my plan is to use these um, aviation plugs. So these, that's what will be mounted onto the box, and then that's what would plug in. Um, they allow for four, four connections on each plug, which is for me is perfectly okay. And then they can be screwed in like that, so that they are nice and secure. It's a lot easier way to take the box off the wall and leave the connections, leave all the wires and sensors in place, as opposed to what I've currently got. Um, and you can put waterproof caps on them as well if they're not, when they're not in use. Um, really nice solution, it's going uh, to look really nice with these. Right, there we are. There's um, 
the bits and pieces that I'm going to be using, the sensors and, and the sort of ancillary devices and stuff like that. Um, and other bits and pieces that you need really to get on with the job. Hope you found that useful. Um, in the next video, we'll be looking probably at circuit diagrams um, and stuff like that, a bit more detail about the wiring and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you've got any questions, then please do leave them in the comments below. Um, happy to answer them as best I can. And with this series, I'm going to try and produce more useful information for you for you know, developing the smart greenhouse with some um, plans as well um, and maybe a github um, the code anyway um, let me know what you need or what you think or any questions in the comments below thanks for watching um hope you enjoyed the video and i'll see you in another one very soon bye for now